my whole entire time here, I've thought about how can, you know, we not only just educate our students or even listeners, it's like, how can we, you know, completely inspire and keep you all motivated, especially when it comes to dealing with situations? Like, for example, let's say that you are in this space where you feel like you finally want to make this a career in design, or maybe you're someone that already has been in the industry for so long, but you feel stagnant. You feel like, where do I keep going? Like, I feel like I'm not growing or learning. And that's what this hustle is all about. It's the fact that you're passionate, you're committed. And it starts with that, being committed to the dream, to what you really want to pursue and do. So you're committed to this, right? You want to go for it. How can I actually make it happen? And it starts by making moments count. When you're in that process of making moments count, it's like, I'm designing. How am I going to showcase my work? And that's where I'm going to take you back a little bit on my journey with that. So I knew I wanted to design and I had gotten some educational uh, you know, sectors that I felt were helpful in developing that. But I always wanted to stay true to signature style, like what my signature style was. I didn't want to copy other designers. And that's when I realized that you have to work out what you love doing. If you're committed to what you love doing and you're going for a hustle, that is the key component is when you love something, especially when you're hustling for it, it's that passion, it's that drive. It's you every day waking up and staying focused on your end goal. And it doesn't mean that, oh my God, I wanna be a designer or an artist, I have to quit my nine to five. I'm gonna be very honest. I worked a nine to five and then outside of my nine to five, it came down to my dream and my hustle. It came down to working for the things that I love doing, which was design. I like book clients. I do styled, um, you know, styled shoots for different designers. I'd find ways to just kind of stay in tune with that. And I'm here to tell you that it's okay if you're, you know, on your way to creating your, you know, dream career. It's fine that you have a nine to five. That's absolutely okay. So it starts with making every opportunity count. So that means networking. So you're new to the industry. You're seasoned and great. How are you getting yourself out there? How are you working with new talent? Um, going to networking events is your key to success when it comes to making connections and learning about things you have no idea about. Like, for example, you can go on a great website like eventbrite.com and look up upcoming events in your area and have you know your nice little stack of business cards and also a good tip for you to know is your business card you could just have one business card with your qr code to your instagram or website handle and literally when you go to events now they'll just ask for your qr code they'll take a picture of it and what's great is they'll take it directly to their your your instagram or your business web page and just like that you're starting to mingle and even if you have to go alone to these things, that is okay. And that's, again, you maximizing opportunities. Like, don't let any opportunity just, like, leave. Like, remember to own it. And even if you're very nervous and you're introverted, it is okay. Because a key thing that I'm going to tell you is whether you are a specialty or full-service designer, for example, as I mentioned earlier, is the fact that you're always learning. And that's a big thing that... Um, a hustler mindset requires is being a sponge and remember that you don't know it all, that you're constantly going to grow and evolve. And that comes with even networking. Like for example, I don't do floral design. It is not my forte. I leave that to my amazing friends in the industry that really focus on that. But what I did learn from my industry florist designers is they tell me about pricing. They tell me about what the names of the flowers are or what's in season, which is so important for you to know when you are working in this industry. It's like you're passionate about something, but what's going to make it so you're that go-to designer is the fact that you're so knowledgeable, that you know so much about every little thing, and it makes you so much well-rounded. You need to understand and accept that there are going to be setbacks. Failures are part of the process. And... The beautiful thing about it is when you're someone who is having that very hustler mindset is 
you see failures as opportunities to grow and learn instead of just moments of sitting there and, oh my God, freaking out and saying, I can't do this anymore. Life is out to get me. Because I want you to remember, life is never going to stop testing you. So when it comes down to it, you want to think about first defining your passion. What are you passionate about? As I mentioned in the last podcast episode, this podcast is all about the designer, you guys, those that are either new to the industry, experienced, that are just passionate about creating special moments, because that's what designers do. They create magical, captivating moments that make someone feel an emotion when they see a beautiful reveal of a wedding design or even a birthday party and etc. Never forget what well, one of the biggest mentors I've had in my life said to me, which was when you have money, you're rich, you let's say start a business and you open and you invest. Great. But when you have the knowledge, someone could, let's say if you lose all the money, I don't know, the stock crashes, whatever the market, there's so many things, other factors that we can control. You're able to start over because you have the knowledge and the recipe of doing it. So therefore, that's why it's such an invaluable resource to have is knowledge. So you first would want to look into getting more perfection in your craft, meaning practice is a big thing as well. Practicing as much as you can. Another thing is putting yourself out there because what good is it? And this happens to all creatives. And make sure to... Um, comment if you resonate with this, that you have so many ideas and you always think about the things you can do, but you don't do them. Because creatives, we're constantly thinking of everything we want to do. But the problem with creatives, we all have a problem with putting it into action, putting it into an actual game plan and going for it. And that's a way, kind of a lack of passion, because that passion is what's going to push you to keep going and actually making money out of it. Because if you're able to, you're able to move on to the next step, which is what we all want. And that's why even here talking to you guys today, it's so important that you focus on this passion that you have in design. Once you have found and defined it, then the next steps you have to take is making sure that you put it into a proactive plan. It's like if you're going to be having your own business, a business owner, think about how you can make a difference. The thing is, when it comes to design, you don't want to just think, I'm making something pretty. You always do things for a purpose and because it is an artistry form. So it's very important that you focus on that. And another thing to look at is if you are, let's say, on social media or you're doing research, look at what other, you know, businesses are doing. Maybe in your area, there is like a need or a lack of a service. I always think back of the student that she wanted to be a wedding designer so bad, and she was great at design. But in her area, she there wasn't it, her like her actual market. I would say was a lot of more like family, like smaller family homes, um, a lot of you know families with kids, and she even had um, a child. And what she realizes when I told her, I'm like, what can you bring that's different in terms of service? I know you're passionate about design, but right now in this stage of your life, are you still passionate about weddings? And she's like, no, I'm, I'm not. I, I know that's what I'm good at. And I'm like, that doesn't mean that's the only thing you're good at designing. You're a creative. That means that you have the skill set and the talent to do many things within the design sector. You could be designing not only weddings, you could do kid events, you could do corporate events. There's so many different avenues. Wherever you are now, think about it. I love design. Where, what can I do with this? What avenue can I take? But what has been some of the most major changes you've seen from like the then? internet? Oh my <laughs> God. The internet <laughs> has changed the way with the business, you know, because, um, you know, in 2003, internet, I love your response. <laughs> you know, 2003, we didn't have a high speed internet like we have now. Yeah. That everything is instantaneous, you know. We didn't Wasn't have it before phones. people had to fill out the forms? It was more paper trail. Oh my God, there was so much paper, there's so much ink <laughs> into those cartridges, you know. And then what we're just discussing about perfect wedding guy. I mean, perfect wedding was, was $750 a month to advertise in your little book. It was a budget so marketing has gotten easier for us now because mm -hmm. the internet has changed 
everything. Yeah. But that was a big challenge to try to find your market, to try to find, okay, who do I want to do business with? Who do I want to sell my services to? I mean, which way do I want to go? Do I want to do rentals, like tables? Do I want to do flowers? Do I want to do this? Do I want to do that? So, because design is just, you could go so many ways with it. Exactly. Some people, you know, like you even see some people will purchase somewhere else because it's cheaper, but it's so important to purchase the right product that it has the FR seal. Yeah, exactly. Because what happened at the, the venue, they asked someone to take it down that they yes, didn't know better. Yes, because if you're not flame retardant, you know, uh, certificate, you know, the fire marshal can come in and remove every single drape, you know, so that is something really important. That's, that is why I know you guys, because I know from... The experts and for people that sell certified stuff, you know, yeah. like, you know, there's other people that buy stuff somewhere else. I don't know if they're certified. I just know my companies, you know, I check my. You make yeah. sure to have like exactly. the right quality product. I have product. to start, you know, I have to comply. That's a draping company. I have to comply with the fire, uh, fire marshal standards. They are standards, you know, even especially because you work in very like high end. Yeah, venues exactly. and they they request that of you yes which i'm sure you know yes yes they go do. in for your listeners for the people that are watching us you know want to share something um networking it's very important very you need to be out there you need to if you're not if you're the owner and you don't want to do it then you need to select someone to be the face of your company because um, when you meet another vendor face to face and when you start seeing the same people in different events monthly, even if you haven't worked with them, you can tell a lot by talking to someone about their ethics, their values, their morals, their practices, how do they run their business, you know. And obviously, as you start doing events with people, then I have my list. I have my black book, which <laughs> I love it. I have, I, have black few, book. I have a vendor black book because <laughs> You know, certain companies in there, I will not do business Work, with yeah. unless I'm partnered with because somebody else hired me. But, you know. But if you had to choose, those would not be the, the vendors you work it, with specifically. There's not many. But it's a couple companies in there, you know. But uh, because I just rely on my ethics, you know. I want to be ethical and I want the person who do business with me ethical 100%. So to your listeners, yes, you need to network. You need to um get to know who your uh, planners are, uh, who's the catering manager at this hotel. And you got to be proactive because let me tell you, in the hotel industry and venues, you know, like country clubs and places that they do uh, special event production, they change all the time. You know, you always have to be presentable. You know, you always, that's what I always tell people when they start listening. I said, I don't care who you're meeting, what you're doing, you'll be presentable. I said, you are just... Just make sure that you walk with, you know, confidence. You know, you have to have confidence. If you were able to file this paperwork, you know, with the state of Florida, you're willing to do all this work, then you just, you know, just got to own it. You know, you just got to be yourself. Especially since, you know, you're out networking and also the fact that you're meeting with clients nonstop. And clients, they'll meet with many, you know, companies. Yes. But what they'll be attracted to is how you made them feel, how you also exuded confidence and were, you know, knew your stuff, which is also another thing that you're very knowledgeable about your industry. Well, you know, to your listeners, to those people that are starting to, you know, that maybe have an idea, you know, they're just starting to maybe leaning towards, you know, owning their own business. I'm going to give you a piece of advice. You have to make a plan, make a plan, you know, uh, look for your resources, you know, around your community, uh, network, um, just make a plan, you know, logistics and planning everything in life has got me to where I am. I've always made a plan. But then another advice that I have for your listeners is that um, you, this is very important. And I've learned this. This is one of my biggest lessons. You want to narrow down what you want to do. You want to be an expert, a master at what you do. Because in the event industry, especially if you want to do a high-end wedding, they're very unforgiving. If you tell them, oh, I do dance floor wraps, I do draping, I do lighting, I do this, uh, people get a little bit, you know, you know, like hesitant, you know. And the planners, the those super high-end planners, they want to hire the best person that does uh, uh, wrap floors, the best person who does draping, the best person who does AV and audio and lighting production. So you have to be very careful because a lot of people are taking on a lot at the same time. And then 
you know, you want to master a craft before you start adding so many things to the menu, which is exactly. such a true point because some what is that saying? Uh, master of I, I forgot, but there's a saying that I remember my ex, my former husband used to tell me, you know, but. You know, you be, have to be a master at something. It's not good. It's good to know a little bit about everything, but, you know, be a master at something. So first thing you want to think about is knowing your SWOT. And you might ask yourself, what exactly does the SWOT entail in design? You want to know what your strengths are, meaning what is something in design that you are really like amazing at doing? Is it, you know, are you a great draper or are you someone that just, really is fantastic at tabletop design. It's important that you know your company's strength because again, that will be something that you highlight in your company. The next thing is knowing your weaknesses. Everyone has a weakness in design and it takes something to practice over and over again. So for example, a weakness may be that time management or is it a lack of staff? It's important that you actually focus and think about what these weaknesses are, because even though they may seem like weaknesses, there are things that you're going to improve and also just put a little bit more focus on to improve. The next thing is O, opportunities. And I would have never known that unless I you know, took a challenge and also kind of did like a self-analysis. So it's very important that you do self-analyze, like what is it that you want to do in design? And it doesn't mean you stick to that only. Like I. You know, in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to do corporate. I'm going to be a corporate designer. That's it. And that wasn't the case. And there's nothing wrong with that. But remember, take some time, sit down and think about it. Because again, design has so many layers that you could just practice at something that you'll realize like, I'm really good at this or that. And that's fine. The next thing is really the most important, I would say, is you need to stop comparing yourself to any other designer or to anyone else who's creating their business or starting off, you know, it's, we're such in a different time frame in life now that you're on social media, whether you go on Pinterest, on Instagram, or even Facebook, and you can't compare, and it's human nature, right? It happens. Like, you'll start looking at other people's designs, and you're like, oh my God, that is so amazing. I, I wish I could design like that, or wow, like, I, how do I do that? Like, I don't think I could ever do that. And the main thing is you can't compare your journey to someone else's because everyone else has their own journey. They're like taking that everyone else has their own like trials and everyone else has their own successes and you have your own lane. And sometimes when we're so focused looking at someone else's greener grass, you're forgetting to water yours and grow your own path. And that's, what's important when it comes to not comparing Instead of comparing, I want you to actually get, you know, motivation or inspiration from seeing these other businesses. Because remember, they all started just like you. Everyone starts from somewhere. No one is instantly, you start a business today and then tomorrow it's like an overnight success. It takes time, it takes dedication and consistency. And that's something you have to remember. You know, when you're looking at these different images, think of, wow, like, that is amazing. I should, you know, get inspired and do my own twist on it and create your own type of designs. Be original with everything you do. Don't focus so much on like someone else's, what they're doing, what ifs, and ands, or buts. Let that inspire you. And it's very important in design, which a lot of people don't talk about, the fact of collaboration. You will collaborate a lot in the world of design. And that's why it's so important to just stay kind of focused on your journey and not so much of like letting, you know, what others are doing kind of be that noise that keeps you off your focus because, you know, before you know it, that, you know, comparing becomes almost like self-doubt and just negative energy that you don't want for yourself. It's really important to practice because whether you're doing tabletop design, florals, you know, backdrops, even working with lighting, you have to practice because you practicing will make it so you're able to book more events in a day because you know taking two hours to do a backdrop is not good because then you can't book many events to design that specific day and that's something you have to think about building a design process which takes us into our next point it is so important to build a process of how to go about designing have you ever been in that situation where someone tells you i want you to design my entire wedding and you're like oh my god that's, that's amazing. You say that in front of the client, then after you leave, you're like, oh my God, 
how am I going to design the whole event? Where do I even start? How many like staff members do I need? Like, w- like how to execute this? Like how to like you ask so many things and you get even so flustered. And I remember that feeling and I get you. So that's why I'm here to tell you, you need to have a design process. It'll make your entire design like roadmap easier. And with the design process, that means that you need to definitely have kind of like an A to Z plan of what you're going to do and how to go about attacking it. So that means if you're doing the ceremony, the reception and the cocktail hour, you need to break it down into measurable design elements. That means that for the ceremony, you want to create a list of what exactly it is that you're going to do in terms of design. Like what is your responsibility? Once you do that, you're able to break it into subcategories of what goes there, like in terms of products and, you know, the different type of like duties that are in that section. And this will help you kind of also breathe a little bit, because if I look at a whole design as a like entire big picture, I'm like, oh, my God, this is like a huge event. 500 people. I would like freak out. So when I started dividing it into like measurable components, which is what I like to call it, like actually compartmentalize everything, I started thinking, okay, ceremony, what exactly am I doing a ceremony? Like what are, you know, the different design, you know, elements that the client wanted for that section? So one thing that I wish that I knew before starting a business was to be organized with your money, which I feel like once you start making money and it's coming in, you don't realize like you have to put it through taxes. You have to write down like all of these things. Um, And I think it happens to a lot of new business owners, especially if they don't have like a mentor or like a parent that's or somebody that's telling you like what to do. And my mom didn't tell me either. Um, so when I was making money, I like, wasn't putting it through my taxes. Now I have like this year, I'm finally going back and doing everything with my account. And my husband's like, I think we owe like a budget for like doing all these things. And I'm like, I wish I knew that. Um, I also wish I knew that I have to be confident when I'm doing things because I would do an event. And then this person was like, I'm going to pay you, but I'm going to pay you after. And I was like, okay, no problem. Cause I was just so scared. And then, you also the sweetest yeah. person I know, super <laughs> chill, so I can see that happen. Yeah, well, not anymore. But um, yeah, she didn't pay me after one of those events, oh and I, we worked for free. So I wish I knew like that. I have to like just know, like step it up. If like someone's you know telling you they're not going to pay you or anything, like it has to be later to just tell them no. You know, like these types of things. So not being afraid to say no. Yeah, not be being sick. afraid to say no. now. My like my mantra now is like. The worst thing that could happen is a no, and then I'll go on to a next person. So the worst <laughs> thing that could happen is a no, and that's it. Um, before my mantra was like, I think it was like a fear of imposter where I was like, I'm just selling picnics. What am I really talking to about these corporate people, you know? But in my head, I think I've always been this person where I'm like, I have this big vision for myself. So I would talk about these picnics and people would ask me like, oh, but can you do this? And I was like, yeah, that's super easy. Like I could do that, but I didn't know how to do it. Um, oh, so I, I would like, so you're you know, just confident yeah. when, especially when you're yeah. speaking to them mm-hmm. and then you're just like, I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to YouTube it. I'm going to Google. I'm going to ask. But it was, it was like, you know, it's starting a business or doing anything is just, it's hard. Like it's not an easy route and it's something that you're like, you know, what guts do I have to do this? But then once you do commit to it, it's like, this is my baby. Like you have to go out there and put yourself out there or else no, you, your fear is going to get in your way of being successful. You, need, you know, like you don't need to have this huge family or like, you know, your husband or your boyfriend or someone to support you. Like if you really want it, like you can just do it on your own. You know, you don't need somebody. I love it. that. Yeah. Say it again. Yeah. You don't Say it louder for the people in the back. You don't need to start your business. Like, if, if it's something that you're really passionate about and that you love, like, why do you need someone to, like, verify that for you or, like, validate that for you, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. I, like, I'm like, should I close out? Like, yeah. We have two more points you want to share. Yes. It's really important. Like, everything, like, if you want to be successful, everything is into, like, detail, 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 you know, because events are detailed and they're somebody's most important day you know it's like your first baby shower your first your only wedding um your big corporate event you know like that's the one you're planning so it's like so important to every single person yeah like i always say like any event you take on yeah it is the equivalent to america with super bowl yes you know how for a super bowl everything stops yeah you go to store every cake is a football everything yeah that's how everyone's wedding day or baby shower whatever it is 
it's about them. It's their day. It's yeah. my day. That's it. No, it's hard to find staff. I think nowadays that actually want to work. No, they were like key lazy. Key thing. Yeah, they were like like slumping their feet. Like they weren't like you know like let's go like let's make this. It's very hard to find people that like love what, what they do. Yeah, that love what they do. I have now. I have them thankfully, which has been a challenge, you know, to find. Um, but I, as the wedding planner, I took off my shoes. It was like a beach wedding. Yeah. I took off my shoes and I was serving. Like I was serving. I was like, I put my hair up and I was That's like, what I like, call hustle. Yeah. I was like Just... running. My dress was all black and my, my client saw it, you know? And I walked into everybody's table. I'm like, how are you guys doing? Does anybody need water? Does anybody need anything? And that wasn't like, I'm very big on like, that's not my job. Like everything is my job. Like an event is my job. Like I don't care if I'm not like the bartender, I will get behind the bar. Like I'm not overqualified for anything, you know. So you guys say, yeah. say it again. I'm not overqualified Whatever. for anything. That is, care. I think, a yeah. quote. I'm gonna have to quote. <laughs> yeah. on. Yes, but yeah, I mean, it was it was a big training point. So after this, we've gotten, you know, we have like now a three hundred and seventy-five thousand dollar wedding that we're doing. So it was a big learning point for me, but also it pushed me and my team like on how hard they went because my team that was also not like bartenders. We were like we had like these custom coconuts. They were breaking the coconuts. Like everybody was all in, but I hired this girl that she was asking. And she was new, and she was asking my team like, "And so, what time is she paying us? Like, what what are we doing?" Like oh, she was like, "One like, of those." But my team is so good to me. They told me they were like, "She's like venom for the team." You know, she's not a good person for the team. Oh, they told you? Yeah, they told me. They because I treat my team really well. Like after this, like I, you know, we took them to lunch. We you know, she's just like a staff. No, they're friends. my family. Yeah, they're yeah. my. They're without them, I wouldn't have my company like I love my team like like they're like an extension extended family to me um but it also made me realize like you need to find the right people to work with and you need to treat them really right like you need to be good to them because you're only as good as the staff you have you know because whenever you have an event um you need to have these people that care about your company like you do or if not like it's not, I don't care how good you are. You need to have five good people with you, you know, no. to have these large. It events. takes, it takes a village. It takes a team to execute. It's never, yeah. that's yeah. why yeah. you brought up a, a, a key thing. Mm -hmm. Always, we always have a lot of people um, that say, can I do this on my own? And the number one thing I always say is like, no, you need yeah. to find a team, a team that will literally gravitate towards you mm -hmm. because it all depends on what type of yeah. like boss you are. Yes. 100%. Like bonuses. Like after we finish this, I gave my girls like all the bonuses. I did not keep all the money for myself. Like I sent um my main event planner at the time. Her she had never been to Disney with her husband and her kids. I sent them to Disney. That's like amazing. I was like, you know, I wanted to do that. And like and that's like what what I love being an entrepreneur is being able to give jobs as well, you know. So it was a big moment for us here. It's amazing. <laughs> I love yes. that. So next slide. Okay, let's see the next This one. is good stuff, you guys. You guys are getting all your <laughs> stuff from Kat. This is a bridal shower. Um, I think it was like one of the first ones that we had where we did all the customizations. So at first, I used to outsource doing flowers. I used to outsource doing backdrops. I used to outsource a lot of different things. And I realized that I could take the courses to become a florist. I realized that I could pay my team to take the florist. Um, courses and I realized that we can also make a couple of things on our own. So education was a big thing. You're like education's huge. Like I believe in I learn I, I love education. Like it's how you get better, you know? You can't like just be like this person where you're not gonna invest in yourself. Like you have I invest in myself and my team. Yeah. Like I take I send them to floor for flower courses. Um I send them to all these different things for them to learn. So it was like our first one where it's like cute, but it's not as good as what we do now. But it was like our moment where I used to pay a florist like this money. And I'm like, I could earn that myself. And not only me, but like my team as well, you know? Um, so it was one of those moments for us. There's so much transformative power that happens in, you know, designing an event. So, you know, the way that you should look at an event, it's like a puzzle. There's so many pieces to make one grand picture come to life. So when you're in this process of designing, how do you find inspiration? Like, how do you, you know, really focus on the creativity aspect? So to help you, first of all, you need to think about what is it that inspires me? Like, what is it that helps me kind of, you know, flow with ideas and just keep going at it? So the first thing you want to think about is clients constantly, thanks to social media, such as Instagram, Pinterest, Google, they have so many ideas of their own that you forget that 
you can use their ideas as a launching pad for your creativity. Meaning, you know, those moments that, like I said, you feel like, what am I doing for this, you know, couple, you know, what type of design I know they want, let's say like a romantic goth design. How do I bring that to life? What does that mean? So the number one thing you want to do first is you want to research. You have to research and really focus on what does this design mean to them? Because what, you know, this design means to this person and to the next person is completely different. Remember one thing, you're always creating a custom design for your clients. So this first photo that's here on the screen, you will see that this design is very beautiful. They use the actual landscape to their favor, which whenever you are doing any type of design outdoors, always use the outdoor space as your inspiration and also as like a starting foundation piece for your design. So if you do have a beautiful design in, let's say the nature picture that's in front of you, like in, like in this one, like with mountains, it's a lot of greenery, it's lush, it's beautiful, it's nature. You don't want to compete with it. So you want to think about how can I enhance it? With this design, the actual thing that they did that really made it stand out by being bold is creating a nice structure framework with minimal draping that looks very romantic, chic, elegant, and modern all at the same time. They incorporate a lot of the lush florals that just enhance the overall space of the landscape versus competing with it. So, you know, they stick within the tones of black, white, and gold. It looks magical. It looks dreamy. Like who wouldn't want to get married there? So think of how you can create a beautiful structure that is just open and allows the actual, you know, nature picture that's in front of everyone to really be a playing part in your design. And never forget that adding draping always creates a romantic effect. So like in this photo, they went with that sheer draping that's very, you know, transparent. So it's beautiful. So it's not blocking any of the view. And it's just, if anything, making it super dreamy. We are in the business of creating memorable experiences. And that's something I definitely want all of you to remember is that you always want to create a lasting impression and that every design you do is an experience for your clients and their guests. And you want them to leave raving and talking about how amazing it was, like how every detail was thought out. And that comes through you just being very precise in all the details and following through on, on the design. And I'm not talking about everything has to be like theme. Like it's not like I'm going to, you know, create a vampire type wedding. No, I'm just going to go off the ambiance and incorporate that into the wedding of creating that moody, romantic, sleek, very sexy, beautiful design. The number one thing I recommend is that you always have a sketchbook with you, like your journal and sketchbook, or you can have one over the other. But let me explain a little bit of the two. So a actual journal is where you jot down ideas because your mind is constantly, you know, going, you want to write down these ideas before you forget. So having a, you know, design journal is very helpful. This is where you would just go and put things into exactly how you think about them. Like, okay, like, you know, how cool would it be to do a avant-garde whimsical wedding and then write down all the ideas that come to mind, the type of colors, the linens, the finishes, all of that. Now a sketchbook is fantastic because whether you are Picasso or not, as long as you understand your sketches, that is gold. So in your sketchbook, you would start, you know, like, let's say you have an exact idea of how you want the grand backdrop to be, or an idea of how you want the sweetheart table to look, sketch it out. And you'll see that that's so good because you'll be able to go back to that when you are, you know, feeling like, Oh my God, like I need, I need ideas. I don't know. Like right now I'm at a place where like, I can't think of anything. And then you go back to the ideas when you were just literally panning them out nonstop and you'll say, Oh my God, this is great. Let me add to this. And then there you go. You found your design spark. Just, you know, really enhance your creativity is by constantly staying educated and, you know, really attending classes and stuff like that. I constantly always love, like, I love education and I think always going to classes to revamp ideas and to also get more inspiration or to learn more techniques is never a bad thing. Uh, as you all know, at Iowa Global, we do have various courses and, you know, with our students, what I love 
hearing from them is how they come to the class and they always feel inspired and motivated and they find a community of like-minded individuals that also like help fuel their ideas to the next level because they, you know, as designers, we always feel like our ideas might be too big or too crazy. And I'm here to tell you they're not. Nothing is ever too crazy or too grand. What it is, is just you need to literally write it out or sketch it out and then build on it and have an actual plan on how to execute it. But it's an amazing thing, again, with education, because like I said, so many times you feel like, I don't know how to do this technique. Like, I don't know how to do this. Well, guess what? There's always a class available to learn. So don't be afraid to also just say, you know what? I need to learn more because when you learn more, you earn more. How do you like follow up on that with, with your team? Like, you know, like you said, like at the beginning training, like you're like, did you come up with a process? Like, you know, probably not. Um, I mean, you know, maybe <laughs> now we do, but in the beginning, probably not. I mean, I think I'm a big believer in seeing it from the top, right? Like, right. Then after that, so you always have to tell people, like, when you take a job with Atlas, this is my expectations. Yeah. Like, we are the best, we offer the best service, we offer the best quality, and you have to be on that train. And if you don't believe in that, then get off the train. And they hear me say it, I'm always preaching it. When I interview people, I'm like, this is what we're known for. So you have to believe in that from the get-go. Yeah. And I think once they see it and they hear it from us, you kind of instill it in them. So, I mean, our delivery drivers, our sales team, I mean, everyone, they have to know how important the service is. And it's not easy. And every single day, I always say there's two things. How does it affect the client and their service level? And how does it affect the bottom line? And as long as we always have those two things, like in mind, when we're making decisions and talking to the client, then the client will have a good experience and they'll come back. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's about, right? Like client experience and your reviews and them coming back. Um, so you just have to instill it in people. Like they have to see it from you because it's like, if you're going to preach it, then you have to believe in it, yeah. you know? So that type of person, you could get thrown in and still love it and survive. Yeah. So there's... Listen, we have a staff of over 100 people. There's always people around 100 you. people, everyone. She just said it like nothing. Over, over. Over 100 um, people. But there's always people to learn from and help and support. And we just got to, you know, we do have training programs. Probably on the lighter side for a company of our side. But we're working on it. We just hired someone new in HR. Yeah. So we're getting there. You know, yeah. we're getting there. But at the, at the same time, like you said, it's just events are nonstop. So nonstop. The whole in-season and out-of-season aspect, like that's another great thing that to be brought up in the rental business like how do you guys work with that like knowing you're in season out of season yeah it's um so in the beginning i would say it was super hard because you have to like let go half of your staff and then how do you bring them back right in cash flow you have no money coming in off season and then in season it's crazy but we've all been doing this long enough where you kind of like you've got it by now, right? Like we already know what it's gonna dip down to. So that's all budget planning. I mean, you know what it's gonna go down to. You have to be realistic that this is what off season is. Um, we're lucky that we finally have enough of a core group of guys that know the drill, right? So if we temporarily let them go, they all come back. And that's my goal, right? That everyone loves the yeah. company enough that they come back. So off season is tough. You got to explain that to salespeople that your commission off season is going to pretty much be zero and you know, in season. Now, like in season is kill it. Like kill in the it. in season, just kill it. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's again, it's part of the industry that when you're new, it's like a shock, but once you've done it once you're like, all right, here it is. And we all need like a mental break. Right. No, absolutely. Otherwise I can't go to the Hamptons and do Jill's Aaron's event. Yeah, exactly. So we all like, need a break, <laughs> a reset, a reset. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, event designer to you listening or watching. Have you ever wanted to find the latest products to have in inventory? Well, look no further. Event Decor Direct is your one-stop shop to get all the material you need from fabric to linens to ceiling drape, hardware, and so much more. All you have to use is a special discount code, I went on cut 11 to get 11% off your purchase. So make sure to use that code, and thank you so much to Event Decor Direct. And then tell, what would you say to someone that maybe is dealing right now with staff of their own and like you said the mm -hmm. in season out of season yeah. what would be the three tips you would tell them about to like assist in that process because it is hard the number yeah. one question i think especially our students always ask is like how do i find staff that when i just in my down season i can't right. pay them 
So what would be three like key takeaways from that? So number one, if you can find a way, a creative way to pay them, try to do it, you know, try to come up with like a creative pay scale where you can pay them. Try to utilize their knowledge and skills over the summer that you might think that you don't need them, but if they have a certain skill that'll help bring in money during season, you know, look at it that way. Yeah. I find that a lot of employees are underutilized. I'm even learning that every single day. So if you really get to know your employees and see how you could utilize off season, you'd be amazed. And just be honest, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it is off season. And as long as you're honest from the get go that over the summer months, I might not be able to keep you on. If they're still willing to take the job, I mean, they've known that. As long as you're not tricking them, you're not lying to them, they don't feel, you know, that they've been You're deceived. up front with them. If you're up front with them, they know the drill. And there are some people who are really looking for that. I mean, they love their summer months. But a lot of us are getting so busy that we find every year that we're keeping more and more people on because there's so much cleaning to do and catching up. And if you prep properly for season, you could utilize them to make more money in season and budget the money. So if you look at it that way, then sometimes that helps, but sometimes it's just is what it is. I can't keep you on from June to October. Ugh. Right. It's like the best <laughs> of both worlds, right? It's like I show you a Pinterest picture, but it's like a million dollar wedding. And you And it's also like, it's a product that it's like custom made from right. like or Italy. It's a photo shoot. It's, a, or, it's not yeah. even a real event. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. it's a photo shoot. You can't have this, you know? Yeah. Um but again, it's our job to educate. And I feel like that's what we do well is like saying I know you love this and it seems like you like modern, you like traditional, you like floral. Let me show you what we have. So what are some challenges and solutions in the event rental business? Pro in your top yeah. three challenges. So the, then the solution, the biggest challenge is definitely hiring and I don't have a solution yet. <laughs> Uh, there's no there's no solution. You just <laughs> post every single day on Instagram and you try to find the best people. So through social media, you post and post. You, you get yeah. some inquiries. I mean, it's tough. That. I mean, we're all in it. Like, I'd be lying to say that we're fully staffed. I mean, I, of course, I have some amazing employees, um, but, you know, we're still missing some. So every single day from drivers and salespeople and admin and, you know, you name it, it's tough out there. I mean, everyone will tell you that. And I haven't found one person who has the answer. So if you do... That advice I'll take, but I don't have the solution yet. So that's number one. That's number one. Number two, um, inventory. Inventory in a rental business is so hard, right? So every day it's a guessing game. How many martini glasses do I need for this season? Uh, how busy are we going to be? Hopefully wow. there's no COVID. Hopefully there is no recession. Hopefully, right? You just, you don't know. Hopefully there's no hurricane. I mean, you just don't know. So every day you're going into season, like hoping that your numbers project a certain way and you think you have it figured out. But that's why I always say like, my guesses are never right. And I need a money tree because I could buy so many of one thing that has been in demand for years. And this season it sits on my shelf yeah. and it's never enough, right? We're all, there's so much competition, like you said. Yeah. So it's, do you have this, do you have this, do you have this? And I'm like, I want it all. Cause I want to say yes, but you realistically can't, you can't because you have a budget. You yeah. can't because you still have to make money and you can't cause you don't have any more warehouse space. Um, so inventory is really hard and looking at what you want because you think it's pretty, but is that really going to be your best ROI? So you could think it's pretty and it's what you would use, but is this what the masses are going to want? So, and buying for different markets is probably the third thing, right? So we have a showroom in Miami, a showroom in Stewart and a sh our main warehouse in Boynton. Cool. Different I mean, demographics. Hello, Miami to Martin County. Yeah, completely different. So I Miami have to day. buy enough inventory that if someone from Stewart walks in, they think something's beautiful. Someone from Miami walks in, they're happy and then meeting in the middle. So finding product that moves nonstop, because if you have product that just sits, sits on, on the shelf, shelf, you're not making money. Yeah. So finding product that you're always making money, but caters to the masses of your like wide clientele is not an easy feat. You have to be in it in this industry your phone rings 24 7 so remember i said the advice that people give me like the work-life balance like there, there is none you know like does that even exist right yeah. um i mean it looks different to everyone but your phones ring at 10 p.m at midnight at 6 a.m it especially is especially your weekends in the event industry stop yeah <laughs> non-stop so it's like sometimes i'm like wait 20 years i've like <laughs> been on i've been doing this but and how do you balance that like how do you balance work and life I, there, I, there is no such thing i don't i don't know i mean right like something no, always honest, yeah. something always gives i always say like for me it's not missing my kids activities right like that's my work-life balance yeah. like 
everyone you prioritize you everyone has to do what looks work life balance for them when i first started i was in the office at seven leaving at eight going to every networking event because i didn't have kids right um now you just have to like pick and choose and i don't miss my kids activities they're all used to the phone ringing and the texting and but you've got to be able to multitask i mean you've got to be able to juggle in this industry like there is no shutting it off and if you think there is get out it's not the right industry for you how important on a scale of one to 10 is it to be socially active on social media? A 10, <laughs> a 10. I mean, like, yes, it's, I mean, I feel like it has helped us grow. I mean, we get leads from Instagram. We, it's all part of the package, right? Like you said, like what makes us grow? What makes us Atlas? Like that is a component of it. I'm not saying it's all or nothing, but people will call me and say, or if I've made a sales call and kind of gave my 30 second spiel, they'll text me and say, oh, wow, your Instagram's beautiful. Oh, wow, your website's beautiful, right? So I'm very big into like that first impression tells a story. So that's where social media comes into play. That a lot of people, my social media is my first impression. And I have to make a damn good first impression to set myself apart from my competitors. Absolutely. So my social media, I want it to be pretty and pink and aesthetic and all the things that we are about. So it all matches up. And you know, as my sales team gets busier, I want to be able to, hey, why don't you go to the website? You know, we're a little busy now. I'll call you back in 30 minutes. But in the meantime, there's so much information there. You could put in a price quote. So the social media all goes hand in hand. It gives you also a glimpse behind the scenes, right? So like you said, like the stuff that people have no clue what it takes to polish a fork. Well, we try to show the burnisher machine and someone standing there and making sure there's no food in the crevices. And so we try to give you like also all like the details behind the scenes, yeah. which people love. Um, so social media That's so is interesting. Huge. It's like it's huge navigating that like how like doing the research but how did you find and say like no i want i want to do luxury like i know i want luxury this is what i want like yeah because at the beginning where you know starting a business you're like listen uh, 500 dollars better than nothing yeah. <laughs> like, i mean i'll be completely honest the one of my first events it was 250 dollars, and i was like oh i'm i'm doing it this is <laughs> I, this is you know we got this but you know after time goes by you're like oh no but that's a big part that made me decide like, hey, what, who are you wanting to serve? Is it, you know, do you want to be budget? Which unfortunately, I mean, there is budget clients and which is fine. You know, there's, there's a company for everybody. Do you want budget? Do you want to deal with, you know, um, mid range? Yeah. Or do you want to go full luxury corporate where there's no questions asked? It's more like, can you make this happen for me? Yes, no, awesome. You know, let's go or, you know. And I decided really quickly, I was in the Palm Beach industry for a long time and I saw that level of client and I've been around it for so long where I was like, this is what I want. Yeah. This is where I want to aim for. I want to. You want to make money. I want to work at the break. Money. I want to work at the colony. I want to work with celebrity planners. That's that was my goal always. And from the get I started with, you know, I would take anything because everybody at the beginning does. But I quickly realized that, hey, I have to like say no to some people in order to make room for the luxury client. And tell us a little bit about the fact that. So when you started also, even now, how do you deal with like competition or even like other services? Like how do you, you know, always just stay cutting edge, which I know because I can see it. It's key things like your social media, like you're very present on it. Also like your business, your whole caliber. It's more than just a drink. It's like an experience. It's like you're hanging out with the Barbies, like mm -hmm. in a way, like that's kind of, you know, mm -hmm. so how, like was it something that just came out organically or you just thought about every single thing as you went? Um, building your business. I, it's something I thought of. I thought of so, so throughout, you know, I was something that I was very, I always wanted it to be that. I wanted yeah. it to be known for that. Like, oh, I, the bar robberies are here, you know, and a thing. And that was at first very promotional, doing a whole bunch of promotional events. And so and then Barbie and, movie came out yeah. and it just blew up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, all, all things of that nature, it was it was making a name for our, for me, for myself and for my business. And then kind of stepping away and focusing not on myself, but like on our staff. And like, this is our team there. They are everything that you, you know, you're imagining them to be. And yeah, it was just throughout and every single event, you pick things up that it's like, okay, this can be a little bit better. And like, oh, we need to focus on this. And I'm very pay attention to detail and all the girls know that. So they're very aware of it. So when something, any little things off, they're like, Hey, when you let you know about this, what do you think? And then, you know, we fix and, and 
adapt as we go. But it's always been a part of my dream as in everybody knowing like, oh, okay, there's bar barbies are here. It's fine. Like they got it. We don't have to worry about absolutely anything. And that's what it's been up until now. So how do you go back to the client and like the charging aspect? Because mm-hmm. they said one thing and then now it's another. So mm-hmm. how did you handle that? So um, at that point, that's something that's in our contract that it states that if, if contract always, always <laughs> have a contract always. <laughs> and it's stated there that if it changes, there's certain fees and things that come into play. And at that point, we kind of take the reins um, and I just kind of can't do what you've asked me to do, because at this point now it's like you said, controlling chaos and figuring out how we can run smoothly with what we have for now. So, yeah, it's been times where the client gets upset and, you know, you have to just explain to them that. It's just impossible. And if they really want to still keep this five star service going, then we need to kind of cut back on certain things or, you know, focus them on the food for some time in order to kind of get ourselves together. But at the end of the day, it's not our fault because we were told one thing and, you know, now we're here. Service. And then what comes behind that? Like setup. All that's included. Like we don't come. All that's that's part of the hours. That's such a key thing. The setup and breakdown process. That's all part of our hours. So if you book a two hour event, you know, for two hours, hours. there's four hours because it's an hour for setup, an hour for breakdown or an hour and a half for setup breakdown. It's the same thing. Um, We just kind of play with it like that. That's such a good point. So many people in the industry always forget to charge for their setup and breakdown Mm -hmm. and mileage or even like overtime. Mm -hmm. Travel fees. So in the bar industry, what trends do you see happening in 2024? So there's a lot of interactive. So um, meaning we have like an aroma bubble gun that it will be. What? Yeah. So there, (laughs) I wish I would have brought it up to show you. So um, it goes over the top of the glass. Uh, You kind of, it's a gun. It looks like a gun and uh, you Put the bubble on top and it's filled with aroma. So it could be, you know, basil. So make it smell pretty. Yeah. So when the guest pops the bubble, they get the aroma and that affects their taste buds. You know, it it all comes together, ties together. And a lot of um, cocktail, that's part of like the cocktail trends, a big one. Also, um, different ice, like ice cubes, flowers and ice cubes, um, a lot of florals. Um, but the more interactive, so smoky cocktails, um, old fashions are coming back. It's a big one. Negronis, all the classic cocktails are kind of making a stand again. Espresso martinis. That's a big one. Um, yeah, those are all the trends that are for 2024. I know that for sure. What's the most significant lesson or piece of advice you've received in your personal life that has had a lasting impact on you? Ooh, that's a good one. That is. Finances. How do I even put that into? Uh, <laughs> How do you put that into words? Yeah, into <laughs> advice. Um, just getting knocked it, no, like it being knocked into my head that finances and knowing your profits and loss and knowing your numbers and percentages is the key to a successful business. And without that, your business will run into the ground. And keeping that in mind every single day, checking numbers and all of that has made a tremendous difference in my business life and my personal life um, all around because I didn't come from a, you know, uh, silver spoon and fork. So I had to learn my way through you it. hustled and do you yep. made your own done. And pioneered my way through and learning that was a big part of it. And that's that advice there was so key, which I didn't listen to it at first. But quickly after the second, third year, I was like, OK, this is real and I have to keep it. So now it's checking numbers every day, um, weekly you know, checking your profits and loss and monthly, quarterly, annually and doing the whole thing. So that now when it comes to, let's say, dealing with your business, right? Let's say that you struggled a lot with budgeting. How can you for the new year take on a new approach? Think about what was it in budgeting that you lacked? Was it the fact that you were not good at following up with clients when it came to invoicing them? Was it the fact that maybe you underpriced? It is very important to find a structure that works for your business. And maybe you want to think about doing packages for the new year, how you can package themes and concepts into your actual business. So it facilitates the process with the client as well. 
It's important to clearly communicate with your clients and use contracts and make sure that all those things that you struggled with in this 2023 year, you adapt and, you know, make edits into your contracts so you're able to overcome those things like overtime or restyling fees. You want to think about all the possibilities of adding these new little kind of like notations to the contract so it makes it a smoother process for you and you feel more confident when you are working with your clients. In 2024, rise to that challenge of actually executing some of those designs by incorporating those elements that you're not as comfortable with. Staying up to date and on trend is crucial to design, especially now to, you know, clients viewing everything online, like they're on Pinterest or they're on Google or they're even on Instagram. Use those different, you know, designs that maybe you're not as comfortable working in and do practice runs. There's nothing wrong with doing mock-ups. Even if it's not doing it for a client specifically, it's a good way to practice is by doing these different mock-ups and, you know, staying up to date with the trends. Know what fabrics are out, know what colors, textures, you know, what type of centerpiece is being used, what type of candles are appropriate for that candelabra. And the list can go on and on. The thing you might struggle with is being efficient with operations and adaptability. The challenge might be time management or like even vendor coordination and just being able to adapt with the different industry vendors that are out there. A solution would be is to create a detailed timeline to kind of delegate tasks and also build stronger vendor relationships by networking and building upon that, you know, industry of like who's who, you know, putting yourself out there, making more friendships and connections. And that way you're able to also have more freedom in using different vendors because sometimes we stick to what we know. And I know for a fact, when I first started, I wanted to stay with just the people that I knew. And I realized that I wasn't growing. And when you're not growing as a designer, you feel kind of stagnant. If you don't look at the things that you can grow on and, you know, improve, then you fall into a way of almost jeopardizing your business. That's what helps us grow and learn is the fact that getting those client surveys or, you know, if you put up a backdrop and it ends up falling, collapsing, and hopefully no one got hurt. uh, But let's say that, you know, you learn that maybe you can't use that hardware or you need Uh, you know, more weight on the base plates when you are going up higher. This is what I mean. You want to take kind of like a self analysis report of your business and say, what are all the things I'm doing wrong and how can I make them better for the new year? People are really focusing on what they see online. It's like a portfolio. So continue that path of staying up to date, publishing photos, even if let's say it's your down season that's not a problem. Publish photos that you do mock-ups and setups at home or even like a nice tablescape or a balloon art or a beautiful floral centerpiece with some draped background that's just like for a little photo shoot. Do little things like that, but stay very active. And again, don't let, let's say, slow business or even your slow season slow you down. Continue because remember, people are constantly getting married. They're constantly celebrating, whether it's a gender reveal, a baby shower. So there's always room for business. And the idea is before you you add people to your team, you have to fill your calendar. That's the first step. Say that again, because I think that is a golden thing, which you just said. Yeah. Before you go and hire a full team, you need to first make sure you're getting booked and busy. Yeah, exactly. That's that's that would be your sign. You know that you can quit your day job. When you're booked out for the whole year, yeah, you know what I mean. If, if you, if you, at least you can, you can, you can scramble with it. You know, you can play yeah. with it. Not to say that's what I did because I didn't do that. I kept the day job while I was completely booked throughout the whole year, but um, it worked out for me because the kind of work that I was doing wasn't that difficult. Yeah. Um, but definitely was a challenge. It was a, it was a. That's where the health thing came in, right? Because you have to spend eight hours on a job. Then you have to spend another probably four to five, six, seven, sometimes even eight hours. So you're doing 16 hours every day building websites, yeah. getting it right, getting it right. Because there's, it's, it, back then when you wanted to do a website, they would charge you $2,500. Yeah. I mean, that was a big thing back then. Yeah. Okay. Moral of the story, kids. If you're going to get into this business, you have to love it. You have to love it. Because if, if you don't love what you do, you're, you're really, you're really going to suffer. You're going to suffer big time. 
Yeah. Uh, if you love what you do, you'll suffer, but it doesn't feel like work. It's crazy. So th this is why I say, if you're doing this business, if you're going for the industry, if you're going for this kind of thing, it's because you love it, because you love it. Don't do it because of the money, because money is great, but not when it comes to all the work that it, that it entails. I can tell you right now, people will get into this industry and they'll be like, oh my God, I forgot that, you know, because they're like, it's, it's too much, or they don't do great. They don't do great at it because they don't put that extra energy into it. And I think that's very important uh, for this industry. You have to give it your best. And I, the people I work with directly, they're all very passionate about it. Like they'll spend the extra, you know, hundred dollars to get the, that whatever piece that they need to make that, that, that decoration look good. Or the photographer will give you that extra hour. If he knows he can get that shot because the sun's going to come down. Just to, like, that's what you need. You need yep. to understand that, that, that passionate people in your crew is key to the success of the group. So, so when you're creating the ambiance for the moment, you know, this is art. You have to be, you have to design, you have to know what you're doing to make that look or create that vibe. If it's fancy, you gotta, you can create a fancy vibe using champagne tones or gold, you know, some people like the dark, the deep amber, what they call amber. So it's just like, at the end of the day, that's what's going to set the tone for when people walk into the room, that first impression. Then you have the moment where the the um, couple comes into the room. Let's say they're getting married. The grand, 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 entrance. grand entrance. Correct. Yeah. They're coming into the grand entrance. And then all of a sudden we're, we're having a, uh, a celebrative moment, right? Because it's going to be fun. We want people to cheer them on as they come in. They're being introduced. Then right after that, it gets romantic, right? So for the moment that they came in, we're going to go up on the roller coaster and we're going to create the drama for, for that moment. So we're going to do the strobing of the room. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Ah, and everyone's cheering. Ah. You even do the spark, the cold sparks. You do like a bunch you can the use, clouds. Yeah, like you, yeah, yeah there's yeah. many things. That's all part of the art. It's all part of the production. Definitely cold sparks. You can use low lane clouds, but that all comes with each each step. So you have to understand that. So now you you hear what I'm saying. You're like, okay, well, well, okay, then it's not just a rinky dinky DJ. It's not just coming in and putting lights. You have to know what you're doing. I gotta go to school. Because it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of weird, you know, concepts. It's, and technology is always changing and, and influencing. Right, right. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what I wanted to say is that technology always changes. So you have to continuously go back and re-educate. So that's another thing you got to get ready for. So education, wanna, education, education, education. Educate, educate yourself. Educate um, yourself. If Iowa uh, Institute provides education, you might as well just come get your education here. You, you'll learn a lot. You'll have a lot of people coming in here uh, uh, explaining to you things that maybe you didn't even think about. So it's always... It'll save you money too because... Yes. I didn't, like I always say that like I didn't like when I was uh, there was never a design school so I had to go through a different route like the whole fashion side, but then when I would do events I would lose money because I didn't know better. Yeah. So sometimes not having education costs you. It costs you. Yeah, it'll cost you definitely. <laughs> I'm like, hey, do you know you know Mamba player or whatever? You'd be like, yes, I have a. Con You've always been very well networked. Like, yeah. Um, so so I, I think it, it comes down to organization. Um, when you've dealt when you deal with high volume clients and you have like a lot of people calling you, you get the same questions almost all the time. Yeah. So eventually you're like, wait, why don't I just do a catalog? <laughs> why don't I just yeah. have the clients myself? Yeah. So eventually we start going out, you start getting business cards and you put them in your pocket. Yeah. Instead of just being like, oh, you're out of sometimes you're so like distracted just yeah. with whatever's going on that you don't think like, oh, let's network. Yeah. Right. So I think that's key. Obviously, networking is key, uh, regardless if you do it physically or if you do it online. You got to connect. You have to connect. This is a business of connection. And if you don't connect, then you're, you're going to be limited to your 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 advancements as far as like growth. So you have to make sure you connect to people. You got to make sure that um, you're also providing them with something to have your information as well, whether it's those phone things that tap and you get the, you know, the, the, the person's tap card. Yeah. yeah those tap cards or, or business cards um, that you're on social media, that you have all, all your information on there. If you're in this industry, you have to have an Instagram. People who are in this industry that I know that don't have a Facebook or an Instagram, I don't know how they do it. I really don't because at the end of the day, there's so much more for you to get as far as work. You're gonna make mistakes. Yeah. You're gonna make mistakes and you have to you have to be able to, to swallow it. That's why I say, you can get beat down in this business and you can feel like I wanna give up, but, but the don't. only thing that's gonna keep you on is your passion, that you like, that you love it, that you like what you're doing.